Good morning. There it is. Well, Brother Dwayne has said that we're taking the dancers to Nicaragua. And we're going to do that song because we're going to shout from the mountains of Nicaragua about what God is doing in all of our lives. And I can't wait to see all the dancers and my wife, you know, dancing in these churches. The churches in Nicaragua, they rock the house. They are loud and they're dancing. I mean, they have dance lines that go all the way around the church. I mean, it's wild. It's awesome. God is there. I want to talk to you a little bit about my experience in Nicaragua. I've been three different times, been privileged to help build church buildings uh, three different times. Um, but the people there are just so wonderful and so accepting of the gospel. The ground is so fertile. They, they want to hear what you've got to say. They're so proud of the, the church buildings and, and things, having a church in their community. Um, one of the churches that we were working on, there's a lady uh, in the community that was so proud of having the church in her neighborhood that she wanted to do something. So what she did, she went home and got a machete. And this machete seemed like it was like 10 foot long. I mean, it was huge. But she came back to the church. She got down on her hands and knees and mowed the grass around the church. How many of us will do that here at Cross Life? I'll get my machete if you will. But we're spoiled. We're so spoiled here in, in North America that you know we kind of expect somebody else to do it or something. But the people there are just wonderful. Now, if you walk down the streets and you, and you stop and you ask people, say, hey, do you know Jesus? And they say, yeah, I know Jesus. So, well, do you know that you can go to heaven? And a lot of them will tell you, say, no, I know Jesus, but I don't, I don't know that I can go to heaven. You know, in their minds, they, the Catholic religion has them so suppressed that they think they have to be good enough to make it to heaven. But when you explain to them, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish. And then in Romans it says, the gift of life, the gift of eternal life is from God. And that is the gift. He gave his son so that we could accept the gift that we know that we can go to heaven. And when you do that and you tell them that, their eyes light up and just an excitement, it changes lives. It not only changes their life, but it'll change yours too. I come back with a whole different perspective on life. You know, I, I think about Nicaragua on a daily basis. You know, I think about, you know, how how impoverished they are. They, they make less than $2 a day in their average income. And here I am after Thanksgiving, I'm throwing away food because I'm tired of eating it. We are so spoiled. We're so blessed, but at the same time, we're spoiled. But uh, if you ever get a chance and these guys will give you a chance to go to Nicaragua to share what God's done in your life and change lives there, and it'll change your life too. All right, Cleegy, thank you. Um, I'm going to share with you a little bit about what the Voice of Hope has meant to me personally. Um, I've been over there several times, and I don't plan on uh, stopping that. It's on my spiritual calendar. Um, there are divine appointments after divine appointments on the mission trip over there. And um, when you realize that you're an ambassador for Jesus when you go over there, and you're actually the one to lead someone with the, with the gospel, to Christ, there's nothing like it. And it takes you to another level. 
and then it makes you want to encourage others to go. And uh, I test the spirits. I don't trust everybody, not even in this church. And it says in the Bible to test the spirits. And I did that over there in Nicaragua with the voice of hope. And I'm here to tell you that they are trustworthy. Um, they're a key to the kingdom. They're actually saving the nation of Nicaragua. And it's a blessing to be a part of it and to take others over there. And um, they've uh, allowed us to start a recovery ministry over there. Amen. The shift is over there in Nicaragua. And y'all, that blows my mind when I sit there and think about all that God's doing. You know, um, it's just an honor and a privilege to be a part of it. And um, I'd like to tell you about a divine appointment we had last year. We were praying before we, we go out that day. I'm kind of shaking, I'm sorry. Um, and anyway, we read um, in the Bible in a quote about Jesus being the bread of life and that uh, we're the ministers of reconciliation of the gospel to introduce the lost of the cross of Jesus Christ. So we went out and um, we went to a business and um, the people that own businesses in Nicaragua, you know, they have more than the others have, of course. And there's kind of a wall built up. But we started talking about what the Lord had done for us and saved us. And um, the man ended up getting saved. And then his wife got saved. And it was powerful. And we sold just a little bit of Nicaragua money, which 10 Cordovas, which is not much. But we wanted to sow into their business. And they handed us a loaf of bread. And you see, that was Jesus, because we had just read about him being the bread of life. And I'd encourage everybody to go. Um, if you haven't been, I'd put that on a top priority to go. There's nothing like it. And um, we're gonna take, we're gonna take uh, at least seven or more this year. And thank you very much. Thank you. Come on, Miss Mary. You, uh, if you're watching online live or you're here and you're not familiar with our church, Cleegee is our recovery pastor. Six. <clears throat> this is the power of the gospel. Six years ago, she walked in this church just out of prison, a meth addict, a meth dealer, and a lesbian, gave her heart to Jesus. She's been delivered, filled with the Holy Spirit, straight as an arrow. Hallelujah, praise God. This is what Jesus can do. This is the gospel right here, hallelujah. Come on, give the Lord a shout of praise. Now you can be seated. This is Miss Mary, and she is, when you go to Nicaragua, she's the boss. I am what they call the antique. Now the she's, hope. she is. She's single and she's looking. And, and I'm told she likes younger men, so bring her the number after the show. <laughs> well, what a way to start. <laughs> I'm going to be looking. Uh, my name's Mary Watson, and I guess I am the antique voice of hope because I've been there the longest and the oldest. Uh, I went, when I was going to church as a teenager, 12 years old, I told my mother that I was going to be a foreign missionary. And I would go every time the foreign missionaries came and I'd listen to every word. But as Brother Mike said, voice, uh, life happens. And I got married and had children and ladies know how that happens. And uh, so uh, Brother Mike was my pastor for 11 years. <clears throat> And I came to Nicaragua with him a couple of times. But first, I decided I was going to uh, volunteer uh, for missions. And uh, they played the song, I Surrender, in church one Sunday night. And I went to the front, and I told Brother Mike I was, wanted to volunteer for missions. And he called me a foreign missionary. And uh, he told me that God knew before I was ever born that I was going to be a missionary. 
So that sort of sealed it all right there. And I've stuck with Brother Mike and Sherry ever since. And about the second or third trip that I made over here, well, see, I think I'm in Nicaragua, uh, that uh, he can't, we went back to Searcy and uh, he resigned from the church. And uh, all of the people were surprised except me, I think, because I seen what was in Mike's heart when he was in Nicaragua. He's like Ray says, we were messed up. And uh, so I've been coming for 10 years, going, coming, going for 10 years. <laughs> Dwayne got me messed up. <laughs> and I uh, lost my train of thought. But anyway, I've been so blessed with Voice of Hope. I have got to see things that most people don't see when they come one week, so you need to come for longer. And uh, I've got to meet so many people, and when I go, I get excited as much as excited that now as I did the first time I went. And it's like seeing family, because um, the kids were babies when I met them, and now they're older. The people, the grown-ups, it's like meeting family. And uh, I get to do, take part in everything that goes on. And uh, my main thing is sharing the gospel. And I get as excited when I share the gospel and they accept Jesus into their heart as they did the first time. Uh, I, like, I love all the other, but that's my thing. And uh, the feeding centers, that's Sherry's baby. And uh, that's really important. The little kids that we met before the feeding centers opened and what they look like now and the way they act is totally different. So please support the kids over in Nicaragua at the feeding centers. That's very important. And uh, <clears throat> it, we have to give God all the praise and glory because we couldn't do anything without God. I would never make it to Nicaragua if it wasn't about God, it wasn't for God. So I give him all the praise and glory. And when you <clears throat> surrender to missions and, and God says, go tell, he don't say if you feel like it, if your family wants you to go or anything. It don't have any of that. It just says, go tell. And when I was young, I didn't know any young people that went to, on a foreign mission. But now you have so many opportunities to take part. If you don't have the finances, somebody will help you go to Nicaragua. And uh, also then about the retired people. Where in the Bible does it say you have to retire when you start drawing your, uh, your Social Security? Okay, so look, I, I see lots of people here that could be going to Nicaragua with us. You know? Let's go! <laughs> And also, I want to tell you, most of you know Mike's not feeling well. But the best thing we can do for Mike is pray for him and the family and have faith and hope that he's going to come through this fine. And then the next thing is support this ministry. Mike's heart is in this ministry. And God, it's God's ministry, but he put Mike and Sherry in charge of it. So we need to keep supporting this ministry any way we can. And uh, thank you for letting us come and share with you today. I love the dance, but the song is beautiful. And thank you very much. Good morning. We are glad to be here. I, I'm at home, and most of you may not, some of you may not know me. I'm gone a whole lot. But... Uh, we want to talk to you this morning a little bit about Voice of Hope, and uh, we're going to start off by just kind of telling you what Voice of Hope has meant to us and how we got to this place. So Charlie's going to take it away. My name is Charlie Brown, and uh, I'm from Perigold, Arkansas, and I want to come to you this morning and share with you how I came to know Christ. In uh, 2006, at the age of 36 years of age, I had never been in church. I had not grown up in church. I knew nothing about the Lord. I knew nothing about Jesus Christ. 
But I knew there was an emptiness inside of me that uh, was a void. There was just something wrong. There wasn't something right. And so a pastor came to my house, and he shared a story with me that changed my life. He told me a story about a God and how much he loves me. He told me a story about a man named Jesus. And he told me that all I had to do is just believe in him and make him the Lord of my life that I can be saved and have an eternal place in heaven when I die. Immediately when I prayed that prayer and got up off my knees, I knew that I had to go tell someone about what I just did. Now, not knowing anything about the Bible or what the Bible says, not being raised in church, I didn't fully understand that until years later through my discipleship walk that I learned that I was fulfilling the great commission that we must go and tell the world about Jesus Christ. In 2011, Mike and Sherry, uh, or excuse me, in 2008, I went on my first mission trip, two years into my salvation, a very young baby Christian, uh, 38 years of age. And when I went, it literally changed my life as far as the way I looked at missionary work and what we're supposed to be doing. And so in 2011, Mike and Sherry gave me an opportunity to come on staff with the ministry of Voice of Hope Ministries. And I'm going to tell you something, that has changed my life more than I ever can tell you what, it, what it's done for me. Uh, I can tell you this, if you had asked me in 2006 or told me in 2006 that in 2014 that I would be standing in front of a church and telling them about God or telling them about Jesus, how Jesus changed my life, I would have said that you're a crazy fool. But you know what? I'm a Jesus freak, and amen for that. Amen. My life was a little bit different. I was saved when I was 13 years old, and I was brought up in the church, and I've been busy in this church for 30 years. I've been busy in this church. Uh, deacon, elder, uh, evangelism, a lot of things that I, I did as my calling in El Dorado. And I never felt called to go across the ocean or to get on an airplane. But one day, I said, okay, I'll go. And I went in 2011 for the first time. And God rocked my world. Amen. In 2012, I went back. And again, it was just, it just blew me away. And the things that blew me away was the, the receptiveness to the gospel, the, the needy, the hungry. All of those was big, but the gospel is what just blew me away. In January of 2013, I sat with Brother Mike under the rodeo down there, and I said, Brother Mike, whatever you need, I'll do anything, whatever you need. I'm saying this, and I own a business, and I didn't really know how that was all going to fit together. But it's fit together great. I can, I can go in parts of the year. I can be gone. I can still fulfill my duties at home. But it has radically changed my life. There's a couple of things, and we're going to try to explain who we are as a ministry. We're going to try to explain what Voice of Hope is about. And we're going to take you on a little journey. We're going to go from here, and we're going to try not to have as long a journey as we did in the first one. But we kind of had a long journey in the first one. But we want to take you along a journey, and we want to tell you who we are now. And I want to, I want to show you the mission statement that... Uh, that we have developed over the just the last uh, about 14 uh, weeks. There is power in the gospel. Amen. No, nope, wrong slide. There you go. And Matt, those colors just really don't go together. <laughs> Our mission statement is changing lives through the power of God manifested in ordinary Christian lives and discipling new believers to become dynamic witnesses of the gospel throughout the world. Throw our vision statement up there. Teaching the church through the truth of the gospel, blessing the poor with the love of the gospel, and reaching the world through the power of the gospel. If you can just grasp just a little bit there, you probably understand that the gospel is important to us. We believe that the gospel is the very heart of our ministry, and we want to always keep it that way. What is the gospel? The gospel is the simple truth that God loves you. It's the good news of Jesus Christ. It's the, it's the truth that we can put in our heart that changes us. It's not just about doing a list of do's and don'ts or, or following the letter of the law. It's about understanding how much grace has been poured out on us, and that grace is what changes our lives. 
There's a scripture in, in Titus 2, 11 and 12. It says, for grace has been given that all might be saved. And it, it, grace, teaches us how to live a righteous, upright life. So we believe that the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, is what radically changes someone, both a Nicaraguan and a North American. Two people at Voice of Hope that we want to reach is the North American missionaries that come and spend their time there in a, in a week-long mission. And we also want to touch the people of Nicaragua. And I want to talk about the North Americans uh, that are coming. Uh, a lot of you guys that I, I, that I know here from Cross Life Church, you guys have come and been a part of our ministry. And you guys know what we're about and what we do. But here's something that as a staff member from our ministry, what we get to see, and we get to see it on a weekly basis, is that we get to see the transformation of North American missionaries that come that literally get their lives messed up. Just like it did me, just like it did Ray, and it did Mike and Sherry when they first came in 2002. North American missionaries literally get messed up. Amen? Have you been messed up if you come? Amen? And what we want to do is, these are some points that I just want to uh, share with you about what we're talking about North American missionaries is that we want to develop a view of the world from Christ's perspective, uh, learn a biblical under, um, uh, understanding of finances. You know, the first time I went to Nicaragua, I thought I was the poorest guy in Paragould, Arkansas. And when I dropped in on Nicaragua, guess what? I was richly blessed. I was highly favored by God. I had so much because I saw what poor was. Another thing that we want to see our missionaries do is that we want them to come to Nicaragua and become an, an advocate for children worldwide, not just in Nicaragua. Uh, the children in Nicaragua are very poor. It's a very poor country. And so we, we offer feeding centers to help feed these children, ultimately sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And also as a missionary coming uh, on behalf of Voice of Hope, we want you to be so impacted by what God is doing in your life that you will come back home and you will be an advocate for Voice of Hope Ministries. You guys, you know, we're not a big fancy organization where we're on TV and we got big banners and TV spots and all that stuff. We rely on word of mouth. You, the North American missionary, coming and, and telling people about what happened in Nicaragua. There's a picture of the national, the Nicaraguan of what it looks like as, as they are reached with the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. The picture is, is that first of all, they get saved. I want to describe someone right there on the screen, our dentist, Mario. He's been on staff about six months. Last summer, Charlie had the opportunity to lead him to the Lord. He shared the gospel with him, and as Charlie came home, Mario wrote him a letter. And in that letter... Uh, paraphrase and in that letter he thanked Charlie for telling him about this great God that we serve for telling him how can he, he can have security and telling him how he can uh, experience life abundantly but the second thing is is that Mario is hungry I'm talking he is hungry for the Word of God we've started doing a Bible study uh, prayer time meeting time for the staff on Friday mornings and he's not a pastor. He's, he's not a, a, a quote-unquote staff member. He's a dentist. But he is so hungry for the word that after it's over with, he calls somebody out. He'll call the, the pastors out. And he'll say, what did y'all mean by that? What did this mean? He's hungry for the word. He's also hungry that people would come to know Christ. Uh, a month ago, second week of November, <clears throat> Charlie had the opportunity to go down there and go to his house for, for supper. There was a plan and a purpose for this. Mario wanted his wife to hear the gospel. Mario wanted his son, Mario Jr., to hear the word of the gospel and to be saved. And they both were led to Christ and they both came to Christ. So we, we're looking for that person. <clears throat> that gets messed up by the gospel, that gets excited about sharing, uh, hearing the word and studying the word, that gets excited about sharing the gospel. 
But the next step is, is that we want to get to a place where they go. Amen. I went. It messed up my world. Charlie went. It messed up his world. Many of you in this room knows what we're talking about. You went and it messed up your world. We want them to have the same opportunities to go. How did Voice of Hope start? Well, let me tell you how it started. In 2002, Mike and Sherry Halsey went to Nicaragua on their first mission trip. And when they went there, it messed the world up. For the next couple of years, they took numerous uh, people from their church and went on various uh, trips to Nicaragua. And not too long after that, they surrendered to the mission field and they left behind a very nice church, congregation, very comfortable life. Everything was easy. The children were being raised. They were in school, graduating. Everything was good, right? But God had a bigger and better plan. They surrendered to the ministry. Voice of Hope was started. Since 2006, Voice of Hope has seen over 150,000 people come to know Christ. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand. Amen. That is the backbone of our ministry is sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what we do. But we do that through so many other ways like feeding children. We're meeting their physical needs. We're going to see almost 250,000 meals fed to children this year. Amen? And we cannot do it without people like yourselves, North Americans that come and see the work of God, see God uh, working in the lives of people in Nicaragua. Mike and Sherry saw that, and all they'd done was acted, and they were obedient, and look where we're at today. The very core of Voice of Hope, <clears throat> as I kind of described earlier, the very core is understanding the grace that God has shared to me and being able to share that with someone else. It's that simple. It's just that simple. You come, you share your testimony, you share what God has done for you, and you share the truth Amen. that there is a possibility to know that you know that you know that you have eternal life. We're, we're moving forward, and the, the steps that we have of going forward is, is kind of three-pronged. Uh, step one, Brother Mike has a vision, and, and it's partially been inst installed, and some of you have been a part of it, but, but the vision is, is called a Hope Center. Amen. It's in the center of a neighborhood that starts, the first prong of it starts when we build a feeding center. Those children begin to gather at the feeding center and the adults begin to gather at the feeding center and they come every day and they become habitual of coming and getting their meal. Well, in that time, those at the feeding center is beginning to share the love of Christ. They're sharing the love of Jesus. And so as that body, the church, begins to form, well, then we build a building. We've got a church, but we build a building. Remember, the church is not the building, it's the people. So we build a, a church, and then we build a building. The third prong is, is, is Mario's part. Mario has dental records on every child that we have at our feeding centers, which is almost 1,100 at this place, at this point. It's amazing, his love and compassion for those children. There's two more steps that we're aiming towards. And one is, is medical care. We want to do the same thing with a doctor on staff as what we have done with a dentist on staff. We want to be able to provide medical care through the feeding centers, through the, the poor and impoverished. The fifth part is, is that you can do all those things, lead them to the Lord, you can uh, feed them, you can take care of them, uh, whether it be uh, dental or medical, physically, but if they don't have hope of getting out of poverty, That's right. they're still in the same doldrums. So we want to provide a, uh, a way of doing job training, Amen. a way of giving them a business that they can help uh, to raise their own 
uh, lifestyle, to be able to raise themselves out of poverty. And so the three, three uh, ways of doing this, number one, was through the feeding centers. <clears throat> Go ahead. Okay. You're on a roll. I'm on a roll. <laughs> um, the second one is partnering with the North American churches. We want to partner with as many North American churches, and as, as was mentioned a while ago, we have been partners with 150 North American churches in the last eight years. But that means partnering, you know, it, churches is fine, but you're partnering with the individual. Uh, I took a team to Nicaragua the second week of November. There was 21 people, and there was 11 different churches represented. Amen. It was cool. Amen. It was cool. We had every background there. I mean, it was from... From Pentecostal to, to Baptist to Methodist, we had a great time. It was awesome. And we worked together just smooth as could be. It was, it was just terrific. And we're looking to expand our partnerships with churches and individuals. You know, where do we go from here as a ministry? <clears throat> That's what we want to take the next few minutes and talk to you about. You know, since 2006... Voice of Hope has seen about $2.7 million come through our organization. Now, if you do the math, and some of you guys are mathematicians out there, you'll see that we've had 150,000 people give their life to Christ. So for about every 18 bucks, we're seeing someone give their life to Christ. That's incredible. That's just good news right there, isn't it? And so what we want to do and what we want to stress to you this morning is that it takes every one of us to come together to accomplish what Mike and Sherry has set before with their vision since 2002. They can't do it by themselves. They've never been able to do it by themselves. And it's always been people partnering and coming with this. So it takes churches. It takes communities. It takes individuals. It takes organizations. It takes people that has a heart, just like we do, to make this happen, to make this machine run. And so what we want to do this morning is just uh, kind of go into the future, what we see for our vision vision for our ministry. One of the things that we want to do is that we want to be able to build a, a team house that will be able to uh, house more efficiently uh, what, our, our, uh, what our missionaries are expecting now. Now, guys, you guys that's been to our, our mission house, now, it's not the Holiday Inn Express, but I'll tell you what, I love it. It's a great house, and it's a great place to be at. Amen? It's a good place. And so we want to enhance that. We want to upgrade that we want, so that we can be able to stretch out uh, more people to come and get them out of their comfort zone and be able to uh, share the gospel about what we're doing. We want to, first of all, finish the five churches that we have with the Hope Center model. We want to be able to add that other staff member. We want to be able to complete that model of the, in the five church plants that Voice of Hope has at this time. And those churches are called Bread of Life Churches. They're Bread of Life Church at San Jacinto, Bread of Life Church at Thomas Borges, so forth and so on. But we want, to, we want to complete that. But that's not the end of the vision. The vision is, is to reach Nicaragua with the Hope Center model. And then once you reach Nicaragua, you move into Central America. You move into Northern South America. You continue to expand. And with that... There is a staff missionary in place at each site, and it continues to grow, and God continues to be magnified. One of the things that we have come to understand, that the model that Voice of Hope uses, you know, Brother Dwayne mentioned just a couple of weeks ago that there is more people being saved in <laughs> this ministry than anywhere else that he was aware of. Amen. There's no place else that salvation is coming the way it is in, in Central America right now. The simple truth is, is that we have a very simple model. Very, very simple. We're not flashy. We're not fancy. We're not, uh, we're not the best looking. But you know, it's, it's that we have a very basic picture that the gospel is the yes. most important thing that any ministry can do. You can feed kids. You can give away clothes. You can build houses. You can do all those things. But if you don't share the gospel, you're missing it. Amen. I heard a, heard a little story. I heard a little story one time. A man said his wife called him and asked him to go and get a loaf of bread on the way home. And he said, sure, I can do that. So he went, home, went to the grocery store and going in the door, he looking down the aisle, you know, you're at Walmart. All the way at the back, there's the milk. He said, I bet we need milk. So he took off back there and he got milk. Well, on the way back in one of those center aisles, 
There was the Oreo cookies. So he got him some Oreo cookies, and he thought about, well, you know, we probably need some chips. So he went around the corner, and he got some chips. He gathered up a whole basket full of stuff, and he got to the house. And his wife says, where's the bread? You know, that's kind of like doing ministry without sharing the bread of life. If we miss that, we've missed everything. You know, when we're in Nicaragua, we are very, very basic with the gospel. The gospel's simple. Amen. The gospel is easy. And Charlie's going to give you an example of how that is done. I want to tell you a story. I want to tell you a story of how Jesus changed my life. The story that I'm going to share with you is the story that my pastor uh, in 2006 shared with me. I'm going to share a story that so many people that come to Voice of Hope into Nicaragua share the same story. I'm going to share a story with you like Miss Mary has told thousands and thousands of times. It's a story of the gospel. And so... I do things a little differently. If you just bow your head and close your eyes, I want to lead us in a story. I want to tell you a story about Jesus. And I don't want nobody looking around. And I want you to concentrate and listen to this story this morning. A long time ago, God created the heavens and the earth and he saw that it was good and everything in it. Then he created man and he created woman. And he saw that they were good. But he gave them a commandment. He told them, don't eat of the fruit. But man ate of the fruit. And at that very moment, sin entered into this world. That sin separated us from God. The Bible says this, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It doesn't matter who you are, how much money you have, what title you have beside your name. You are a sinner and it separates you from God. The Bible tells us because of that sin, the wages of sin is death. We deserve death because of our sin. Now let me make it very clear that God loves you so much. And God wants you, but he doesn't need you. So God saw that he had a problem. And this is what he did. We read it in John 3, 16, the mega verse of all verses in the Bible. And it says these words, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, Jesus Christ. That if you believe in him, you should not perish but have everlasting life. That's what God did for you. So when Jesus went to the cross, he took your sin, my sin, the world's sins, and he put him on his shoulder, and God poured his wrath out onto Jesus. And Jesus died. But here's the hope. Here's the good news. On the third day, God sent an angel down. He rolled that rock away and Jesus came alive and he's not dead in that tomb. He's alive today. And because of that, we have a way to heaven. It's through the cross. Jesus said these words, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. That's the only way. When my pastor shared that with me, I asked him, how can I get saved? And this is what he said. He said, we're going to pray a prayer. But there's nothing fancy or magical about this prayer. He said, you have to believe in your heart. He said, you must confess to God that you're a sinner. Because we all are. Then you must ask Jesus to come into your heart. And then you got to ask God to forgive you of your sins. But here's the biggie. you got to make Jesus the boss of your life. 
There's the key. And so I prayed that prayer. And I asked Jesus Christ to come into my heart. And I believe without a shadow of doubt that Jesus saved me that day. And he can do that for you right now, this morning at Cross Life Church in El Dorado, Arkansas. He can do it for you. Now, I believe in my heart there are some people here that does not know Jesus Christ. And so here in a few moments, I want to share that prayer with you and lead you in a prayer. I want to give you the opportunity to ask Jesus into your heart and make him the boss of your life. If God is speaking to you this morning, I urge you to pray this prayer this morning and make a change in your heart. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around, let me lead you in this prayer. If you're a believer, repeat after me. If you're not, let's pray this prayer. Pray with me. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. I ask you to come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. And I make you the boss of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, look at me. If you prayed that prayer, and it's the first time you've ever done that, and you meant it with all of your heart, would you be bold and courageous just to stand up where you're at and say, I received Christ this morning? Would you stand? Amen. Brother Dwayne? Give these guys a hand. Didn't they do a good job? I want you to welcome and greet, truly, one of my spiritual heroes, my sister, Sherry Hulsey. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you to my brother and uh, for all that he has meant to me and to our ministry, for his support and his love. Y'all gotta give me a minute. <laughs> Second of all, from the bottom of my heart, on behalf of Michael, myself, and everyone at Voice of Hope Ministries, thank you. Thank you to Dwayne Miller Ministries and to Cross of Life Church for all you've done, for all your prayers, all your financial support, all your teams that you've brought, for all you've done working along beside us and with us to accomplish God's will and God's purpose in Nicaragua. Thank you for being the number one giver and supporter of our ministry this past year. Your church has supported our uh, ministry. Uh, you're the number one giver. You've given over $200,000 this past year. Amen. Give glory to God. We are so thankful that God has not only brought you along beside us to work, but we are so thankful for not what you've done in the past, but we're thankful and we're looking forward to what we're going to do in the future. Amen. And um, we know that God is a great God. He's got a great plan. Hallelujah. And he's got a great future for not only Voice of Hope, but for Cross Life Church and for Dwayne Miller Ministries. 
And um, as most of you know, um, Michael we just found out that he has cancer. He has stage four renal cell cancer. But we know this. We know God's in control. And we know God is a great God. And we know that he's a, a God of healing. And um, we're praying for a miracle and for healing. But we also know that it's in his hands. And that's, we're going to trust him and we're going to step out on faith. But this is what else we know. We know despite what Satan is doing and despite the attack that Satan has, that God's going to prevail and God's going to win the battle. We know that, that God's hand and protection is on Voice of Hope. We know that God wants Voice of Hope to continue. And this is what else we know. We know Satan doesn't. As the Charlie and Ray shared with you earlier, over 150,000 people have come to Christ over the last 10 years. This past year, this past year, over 14,000 souls have been saved. Cross Life Church, you've helped make that possible. You've helped be a part of that. And we know that God wants that to continue. Yes. We know God doesn't want that to stop. And so we know that God is going to conquer. And we know that Satan has already lost the battle. Yes. And irregardless of what happens to me, Michael, my family, Ray, Charlie, whatever, Voice of Hope Ministry is not based on us. It's based on God. He is our foundation. And God's going to carry on. But let me tell you, he needs people like you. He needs churches like yours to help to continue to reach souls for Christ. And as Ray and Charlie have expressed to you, our main purpose and our main goal through Voice of Hope Ministries is to see people one for Jesus Christ, Amen. see souls saved. Mm -hmm. That is our num number one purpose and our number one goal. But we also know that God has so much more. And he wants to do so much more for the people of Nicaragua. But he also wants to do so much more for the people in North America, for the churches, for this church. Hallelujah. He wants to do so much more. And he wants you to get on board. Yes. And he wants you to be a part of it so that he can bless your life. Amen. And so that he can uh, uh, receive the honor and the glory that he deserves. Um, so, again, thank you so much, church. I ask that you please continue to pray, to support, and be a part of our ministry. I pray that you would continue to lift Michael up in your prayers. Uh, that he will continue to gain strength. And I know that God is a God of healing. And I know that my husband's going to be healed. Amen. I know that he's going to be healed. And I know that uh, God loves him and God's going to care for him and he's going to take care of him. Hallelujah. Uh, again, thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. I want to read a verse of scripture from John chapter 12, verse 24. 
This is a summation of who and what we are in the kingdom. This is our purpose. In John chapter 12, verse 24, most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. One of my favorite stories, and many of you have heard it many times and you'll hear it many more, and I'll give you the quick version. David and Svi Flood, Scandinavian missionaries, made their way to the Belgian Congo. They were trained in a school there to speak the language. Along with another couple, the Ericsons, they made their way into the mountains of the Belgian Congo and came to a little village called Indalara, where 600 people lived. These were pagan, Satan-worshipping, witchcraft environment people. And for fear that they would curse their gods, they would not allow the missionaries to come in and tell anyone about Jesus. But these, four, these, these two couples, these four people and their children were determined to share the gospel. So they moved up the mountain a mile away and they built mud huts and they lived there. The chief of that tribe softened just enough that he let a little African boy sell eggs and chickens to them twice a week. Sfi Flood was a young lady in her late 20s, four feet, 10 inches tall, 95 pounds, kind of like my sister, just a tiny little thing, but how many of you know dynamite comes in small packages? And so she was determined that if the only African she could win to Jesus was this 12-year-old boy, she would, and she did. She gave birth to a little girl up in that mud hut while they were there, named her Aggie. Because of malaria and the complications of that region, Sfi Flood, at 28 years of age, died. She was buried in a crude grave with a white cross. David snapped got angry at God, took his two-month-old child and his little boy and made his way back to the mission station where the Ericsons had already preceded them because they were sick with malaria. He walked into the mission station and he took that baby and he handed it to the Ericsons and said, I can't raise this child. God has forsaken me. God has cursed me and I'm going home. He took his son and made his way back to Europe. Just six months later, the Ericsons both died from malaria. And now you have a little girl less than a year old with no parents, no godparents, no hope. A North American missionary couple who were there took her as their own and raised her. And then when it came time to come home on leave and furlough to raise their support, they brought her home. But she was not legally their daughter. And for fear that they would lose her, they stayed in the United States and pastored churches across the country and ended up in... Minnesota. There, little Aggie went to Bible college where she met a man named Dewey Hurst who was called to the ministry. He became her husband. And they wound up being the presidents of a Christian university in Seattle, Washington. One day, out of nowhere, as she was living life, serving her husband, serving God, raising her children, she went to her mailbox and there was a missions magazine written in her native language, Scandinavian, and she couldn't understand it because she never learned the language. And she opened it and was thumbing through and all of a sudden she turned to this page where she saw the name Svi Flood, a crude grave and a white cross. She knew that was her biological mother's grave because her adoptive parents had told her about the sacrifice her mother had made. Svi Flood had died there giving birth to her. And she wanted to know what was in that article. So she took that article and she carried it to the Bible college. She found a professor that could speak the language and he read the article and basically read her parents' life story and how that she was born, the mother died, the father left, and they did not know what happened to the little girl. But here's what the article said. The article said that that little African boy who had accepted Jesus, who was the only convert they had, had gone to college, had received an education, had come back to his home village, and there, because he had, 
He received status with an education. The chief allowed him to teach the children from the Bible how to read and how to write. And by this time now, the entire village had become 100% Christian, had accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. On their 25th anniversary, Svi and David Dewey Hurst, I should say Aggie and Dewey Hurst, were given a gift to go to her homeland where she would look up her biological father. When she found her siblings, her step-siblings, he had remarried and had children, she found that uh, they were telling her, you can go in and see dad, but don't mention God because he gets very angry. He's an alcoholic and he's dying. Little Aggie walked in the room that day Her father, that she had never met, had his back to the door and he was facing the wall. When he walked in the door, she said, Papa, and immediately, without seeing her face, he called her name. He knew who she was. They sat and they visited and she talked to him about the Lord and he got angry and he said, don't tell me about God. God left us and forsook us and she pulled out that article and she said, no, Papa, You and mama gave your life so that a whole village could be saved. David Flood got down on his knees and recommitted his life to Jesus. Two weeks. Two weeks after she went home, her father died. Some years later, she and her husband Dewey were at a evangelism conference in Europe. As they were listening to all the different mission reports from around the world in this organization that they served, there was a man who stood to give a report from the nation of Zaire. He was a tall, eloquent African. He gave the report and said, I come from a little village called Indalara in the former Belgian Congo, I now am the superintendent of the state denomination. And I'm here to tell you that in our nation now, we have over 150,000 believers in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That was the 12 year old boy that Svee Flood led to Jesus. Our responsibility is not to win the world to Jesus. Our responsibility is not to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to cast out demons. Our responsibility is to be obedient. Our responsibility is to share the gospel, to preach Jesus Christ, to operate in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the same today as it was when he walked the dusty streets of Jerusalem and Judea and he went around doing good, healing the sick, but he did it so that he might introduce them to the unconditional, supernatural love of the Father that they might know the forgiveness of their sin and be born again and have a relationship with him. What can you do? You can go. Be obedient, you can go. You say, well, pastor, how do I go? Talk to Pastor Ray. He has several trips. I need you to go with me next June, June the 26th through July the 3rd. I promise you, I've carried people of all ages. I've carried people of every background. You can do this. Our trip costs $1,995. We're having a crusade. You know what? I love all the other trips, but I want to tell you something. There's nothing like the crusade trip because that's where you see the signs, wonders, miracles, and the masses come to Jesus. Rabbi Landry and I saw 3,754 people give their heart to Jesus in Managua this last year. Miracles, signs. We saw one night, we saw dozens of deaf people healed in the crowd. We never laid hands on a soul. He just spoke it out. Dozens of deaf people completely receive their hearing right there. It's not about the miracles. And you know what? It's really not even about the souls. It's about obedience. Unless a grain of wheat fall to the ground and die, it remains a single seed. 
But if you die to you, if you die to self, if you die to what you want, if you die to your own life, you produce a great harvest. So you can go. You say, well, I can't go. I just physically, I've got children. Well, you know what you can do? You can send someone. You can write a check and send some young person, change their life forever. There are many here whose lives have been changed. So you can go. You can send. You can sow. We're going to receive an offering this morning, and 100% of that offering is going to go to Voice of Hope. Last night in our board meeting, our annual board meeting, Pastor Mike was talking about the needs of the ministry. Transportation there is very difficult because you can rent transportation from someone, rent a van, rent a bus, but if it breaks down, they don't have the money to repair it, so you're actually renting the vehicle, paying for the repairs. You're spending twice as much money, and you don't own the vehicle. So he was talking about someone in the United States helping them with a van. And he said, now we need a utility truck for the feeding centers, building the churches. We need this truck. And I said, how much will it cost? He said, $17,500. And immediately, just in faith, I said, Dwayne Miller Ministries and Cross Life Church will buy that truck. We'll buy that truck. You know, the Bible said, God loves a cheerful giver. Hilarion is the Greek word, and, and yes, it means he loves for you to hysterically give. But that word in its literal root means spontaneous. He loves a spontaneous giver. When God says it, just do it. Can I tell you this morning, I stood right here in the early service, and I said everything that we take in this offering is going to Voice of Hope. And I said, you know what? Even if we take $100,000 we're going to give that to the voice folk. A couple in our church, a man heard God speak to him. He went home. He said, what number did God give you? They texted him a few minutes ago, and they're writing a check for $100,000 to Voice of Hope. Come on, somebody shout and praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God's a God of miracles. Stand on your feet. God's a God of miracles. Brother Rob, will you bring that basket down here? You might say, well, I don't need to give any money then. <laughs> no, let me tell you something. When this kind of miracle happens, it's like the water is stirred. You want a miracle harvest? You want a miracle harvest in your life? Listen to me. God taught me this a long time ago. I, I used to almost apologize preaching about giving. You know, let me tell you something. I don't anymore. You know why? Because that's the key to your heart. You show me where you put your money, and I'll show you where your heart is. That's what the Bible said. You want to unlock miracles in your life? So, and so till it hurts. So sacrificially, like that couple this morning. My wife and I, listen to me. I say this to the glory of God. Uh, people criticized me years ago for starting Dwayne Miller Ministries. They said, well, why do you need to do that? I said, I'll tell you why. Because I need to be able to obey God without anybody's permission. You know, the, the church system's broke. When you give people a vote, you can never get beyond the most carnal person in that church. You know what? We don't vote here. If you've got to be in a church where you get to have a say, this ain't your church. You don't get no say. Some says, well, who do you answer to? Hold the Holy Spirit. That's exactly who I answer to. Very simple. Now, I'm not saying we're not accountable. We're accountable for everything that goes on here and every dime, and I don't touch the money, praise God. I don't want to touch the money. But my wife and I started Dwayne Miller Ministries, and our goal was to give sacrificially. And I can tell you that we sow 
35, and this year we believe we're going to sow 40% of everything that we make into the kingdom of God. Our goal is to sow 90% into the kingdom of God, live on 10. Wouldn't that be awesome to live on 10% and give God 90? You know what? If God can trust you with a little, he'll give you much. We need to buy that truck without touching that $100,000. We need to, I'm committed that we through the storehouse and Dwayne Miller Ministry is going to buy that truck. I want to ask you to sow sacrificially today. I want to, I want to um, put the video, if you will, of Mike up. He couldn't be here today, but I want you to hear from him. And I want you to just remain standing. You've been sitting a long time. If you have to sit, that's fine. But I want you to hear from Pastor Mike and hear his heart about what God's doing, and then we're going to receive the offering. One of the things I want to talk to you today about is the opportunity that you might have to go on a mission trip like this, to come to a foreign country and to be a part of what God's doing here. You know, 50 years ago, it was difficult for somebody to go across the world to do a mission trip someplace, but now in our age of technology, you can get on a plane in just a few hours, be in a foreign country and be a part of a mission trip working. And I believe it's so important for you to understand how God is working and how God is moving by being a part and giving of yourself. Uh, to something like a mission trip or working with Voice of Hope and coming to a place like this. You'll get to see firsthand the way most of the children in the world have to live their lives. It'll break your heart and it'll change you. It'll change how you look at the world and it'll change how you react to the world. And one of the greatest problems I believe that we face in America today is that we are insulated from the hurt and the pain that we live in in a fallen world because we don't see it. If most of the world is really living on less than $2 a day, you need to be involved. You need to come be a part of something like this, become an advocate for children all over the world and help make a difference in Jesus' name and show them love and that you really do care. It's one thing to send your money. It's another thing to say, here am I, send me. You can go, you can send, you can sow, and win the world to Jesus. That's it. Go or send. Sow and win. Listen, my wife's got a little video here. You might say, well, it's hard for me. Maybe you live on a fixed income, and maybe you really do struggle financially. Here's a program in the feeding center that for 17 cents a day, $45 a year you can feed a child. And not only are you feeding that child, but when he comes or she comes and they bring their bowl and they, they receive that mixture of vegetables. And, you know, this is not some tasteless stuff like you see on television. This is real food. I mean, these are vegetables, nutrition-rich vegetables and, and meat sometimes. And they take that home, and every one of those children, listen, they don't just eat that. That feeds their whole family that day. So you're not just feeding 250,000 meals to 250,000 children. You're feeding 250,000 families. Because that child will go home and share that with his brothers and his sisters. And so while we were there, I asked Debbie to make this. And we've put this on television all over the world. And you can be a part of this. So would you play that one, please? this precious child. Look at the smile on her face. 17 cents a day and you can feed this baby. We need your help. Call the number on the screen and help feed these precious children. We're sharing the gospel with them this week, but we also have to share the hope 
of Jesus Christ through feeding and providing for their physical needs also. So please call the number and help support Precious Naomi. If you'd be interested in sponsoring a child, see Pastor Ray or Pastor Charlie, either one, immediately after this service is over. They can tell you how you can do that. And you'll receive a photograph of the child that you sponsor. $45 a year. Can you imagine? Think about that. 17 cents a day. You can't buy a piece of gum, I don't think, for that in the United States anymore. So I want to encourage you right now to just close your eyes. Holy Spirit, speak today. Speak today. And give a number to every person. If you listen, God will give you a number right now. It might be 10 cents. It might be a dollar. It might be a hundred. It might be a hundred thousand. Everything in between. There might be someone watching online somewhere in the world that could write a check for a million dollars. Can I tell you something? If we had a million dollars, we'd win the whole nation of Nicaragua to Jesus and move on from there to Honduras and to Costa Rica to Guatemala, to South America. I'm telling you, Holy Spirit, thank you for that number. Thank you for that number. We're going to be obedient. Everybody, if you'd look this way, listen. I promise you that Debbie and I try to set an example in giving sacrificially, not only to this ministry, but to Israel through Kurt Landry Ministries, to take care of the needy, hurting children of Israel. If you'll be obedient, God will bless you. Now, you might be here today as a young person, and I realize young people don't carry cash. I know that because when I take my staff out, I have to buy lunch all the time. (laughs) And young people don't write checks, but you have debit cards and you have credit cards and I don't advocate you ever giving on credit. Don't, you don't give something you don't have, all right? That's, you don't have that. But if you have, like I do, if you have an American Express or and we'd rather not use that because they charge us way too much money to use it. But if you have a Discover or a MasterCard or a Visa or if all you have is an American Express, uh, Pastor Mark is somewhere, probably out there in the foyer. He's the a uh, goofy dude with a bow tie. Okay, I promise he's harmless. I know he loves and plays with goats, but he's harmless. That's an inside joke, okay? He raises goats, but anyway. So if you want to give electronically with a card, you can see him. He'll make that happen. Take your seed. Claim your own harvest. Hey, if you knew how much I was believing for, it'd blow your mind. I need so much. I told the board last night, the only thing between us and winning the world of Jesus is the money. We've got the message. Hey, the money's coming. The money's coming. This is a sign of it right here today. The money. I want you to agree with me right now. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I speak over that $100,000 seed and I declare a hundredfold return that is a minimum of $100 million. A $100 million return on that $100,000 seed. God, I speak it and I command the devil to get off of the future of that couple who gave that seed sacrificially and declare that it's a $100 million return in Jesus' mighty name. You can bring your seed, sow it, and we will see you Wednesday night at the children's program. God bless you.